Okay, so today I'm going to talk about a strategy to combat multi-resistant bacteria. And my talk will mainly be about the development of orthogonal screening systems for metallobetalactamases and a little bit of compound modeling in the end. Bacterial resistance is a quite old problem and everybody knows this famous year of 1928 where penicillin was discovered by Fleming. But rarely known is that even before people found out how to make big amounts and could bring penicillin to the market in 1942, the first resistance was reported in 1940. <coughs> so we are dealing with a quite old problem, but this is very much accelerated nowadays because antibiotics are used in so many ways and um, in livestock, for example, a lot. And uh, this leads to many multi-resistant bacteria. And the OECD guesses that nowadays already 50% of all infections worldwide are caused by multi-resistant bacteria. And uh, this is a lot. So we're dealing with a very important problem here. And uh, there are several resistance mechanisms for bacterial cells. The first one is uh, if your antibiotic can make it into the cell, the target site can alter it and the uh, antibiotic cannot bind to it anymore. Second possibility is that uh, especially gram-negative cells have a lot of uh, mechanisms to decrease their permeability so that the antibiotic cannot go inside the cell anymore. Um, and even if it can uh, go into the cell, these uh, bacteria have a lot of mechanisms to uh, express efflux pumps that uh, bring the antibiotic out again. And uh, last but not least, there are enzymes uh, that uh, degrade your antibiotic so that it cannot work anymore. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'm gonna, going to speak about metallobetalactamases. These are, as the name suggests, enzymes that cleave beta-lactam antibiotics. And these are very common antibiotics like penicillin that mostly everybody of us has taken so far. And these beta-lactam antibiotics have all in common this four-membered ring here. And this is a good scaffold because it mimics the structure of the DLNN, DLNN dipeptide. You see here in red, and there's the same structure here. And this uh, structure is important if we look at bacterial cells because they don't have the membrane only, like every cell. They have this murine outside, which makes them much uh, harder to penetrate. And this murine is uh, built of sugar chains, and these sugar chains are uh, cross-linked via peptides. And this cross-linking, like here in the open form, is done by an enzyme called transpeptidase. And this transpeptidase uh, recognizes the DLNN, DLNN structural motive I just showed you, and links this. So if we now take a beta-lactam antibiotic, this mimics the DLNN, DLNN that binds to the transpeptidase and inhibits this last step of the bacterial cell wall synthesis. So it goes back to this open form and leads to a destabilized uh, layer and uh, leads to the lysis of a cell. So we have a healthy patient. The problem is now if there are these beta-lactamases expressed because these enzymes cleave uh, the amide bond of the lactam and bring it to an open form here. And this one is inactive at all. And the nucleophilic attack here is uh, done by different uh, enzyme types. Most known are the serine beta-lactamases, which are classed in A, C, and D. And we are dealing with the metallo lactamases As the name suggests, they have uh, metal ions in their active site. In the case uh, here, they have normally two zinc ions. And these two zinc ions are important because together with the aspartate of um, the binding site, they localize and polarize a water molecule in between them. And this is used uh, to nucleophilically attack the ring. And during the ring opening, uh, the water is added, and at the end you have the open form, the inactivated beta-lactam, and you see the protein has not changed at all. The enzyme goes back, water comes in again, and the cycle starts over and over again. So there's no co covalent intermediate at any point 
so it works more like a metal catalyst, and this leads to very high cleavage rate. So it's extremely dangerous uh, when you have uh, infections with these metallobetalactamases. And um, the surprise is there are no clinical relevant inhibitors known so far, and there's nothing in clinical studies against these metallobetalactamases. So the goal of this project was, of course, to identify new inhibitors for these metallobetalactamases. Uh, because if they, the lactamases are uh, inhibited, this protects your beta-lactam antibiotic from the cleavage and restores the activity of it. So we were working with three different uh, metallobetalactamases, the New Delhi metallolactamase 1, uh, the Verona integron encoded metallobetalactamase 1, and the imipenemase 7. They all were isolated from patients at the University Hospital in Frankfurt, so these are not problems that are far away from all of us. They are mostly in your city as well. And uh, we wanted to find an inhibitor which uh, inhibits all three enzymes, and uh, therefore we wanted to develop an assay which is suitable for all three proteins. And um, the format should have been a 96 well plate where you can pre-incubate your protein with uh, possible inhibitors for half an hour, add a substrate and get a readout that you can uh, detect in kinetic cycles. And the search for the substrate was the most difficult part of this project. First, uh, we tried with imipenem. This is an essay which was published by Guo et al. in 2011, and they did it in uh, cuvettes, so in a very big uh, volume, and we wanted to scale it down to 96 well format plates in about 100 microliter volume. This worked out quite good. Uh, what you measure in this essay is the decrease of uh, this compound, it's slightly yellow, so you can uh, measure it at 300 nanometers. And um, this worked out quite good, but as most of you may guess, 300 nanometer is a very bad wavelength to detect uh, when you are screening novel compounds, because a lot of uh, compounds absorb at 300 nanometers. So the assay worked, but it was not what we really wanted, so we were looking for a new substrate, and found nitrocephin. Nitrocephin is the standard uh, de detection reagent that they use in the hospitals because the cleavage of the amide bond here in the ring, uh, you can see it with your bold eye. It turns from yellow to red and we could see it in our plates as well. But there is a problem. Uh, nitrocephin has a very low Km to the uh, enzyme, so it's very high affinity binding compound to the metallobetalactamases, and you nearly cannot detect the yellow state. You add the substrate and it's about 100% on the right side, so you have to scale everything very much down to be around your Km, and then you reach the detection limit of your plate readers. So this was not suitable like the other one, so we went on with our search and found Santa, works in a similar mechanism like nitrocephin, turns from yellow to orange. You can see it again with your eye. You don't need a plate reader, but if you want to do it on the plate reader in reasonable format for your essay, it reaches the detection limit. So we overall decided after three attempts that uh, colorimetric substrates are not sensitive enough for these beta lactamases. And uh, therefore, we went on and looked uh, with more attention to fluorescent substrates. And we found fluorocillin. Fluorocillin consists of a defluorofluorescent core. And this is coupled to two cephalotin moieties on the left and on the right side. And with addition of the metallobetalactamases, the nucleophilic attacks leads to a bond shift. And at the end comes out your deprotonated uh, fluorescent uh, core, which you can detect at the standard fluorescence wavelength. And this worked out quite good. And uh, we could use this assay for all three uh, enzymes. We did it in 96 well plates in a final volume of 100 microliter. Used HEPAS buffer at physiological conditions. 
We could add some detergent for better compound handling and micelle uh, avoiding. 1% DMSO for compound handling was okay. I will show this again on the next slide. Uh, protein concentrations had to be adopted because there are different cleavage rates for the three different uh, proteins. So we took five picomolar of NDM1, four nanomolar of WIM1, and 100 picomolar of uh, IMP7. The substrate concentration was the same in all assays at 888 nanomolar, and the assay was conducted at room temperature. Uh, for those who are quite good informed about assay development, they will always ask for two parameters which are very important. The first one is the Z prime factor. This is calculated according to this formula. It's one minus three times the sum of the standard deviations of your positive control and your blank divided by the mean values that you measure, again, of your positive and your blank. And if this value is below zero, your assay is a crap. You can directly throw it away and look for a new one. This was, again, a problem with the nitro and the Santa, for example. If your uh, that prime is between zero and 0 0.5, your assay can be good. You have to really check your results. But you normally desire to have a that prime below, uh, above 0 0.5. And with the setup that I just showed you, it was always above 0 0.8, so we have a reasonable setup. Second uh, parameter is the signal-to-noise ratio, which should, of course, be as high as possible. And for this assay, it was always above 20. So during my development, uh, the group of King et al. published Captopril as a reference inhibitor for NDM1. Captopril is normally an ACE inhibitor, which makes sense because this is a zinc-dependent protein as well. And I could uh, reproduce a similar IC50 like in the literature. And the good thing about this compound was it was soluble in water as well as in DMSO. So you can really good measure the influence of DMSO in your assay, which was here uh, tolerated up to 5%. And I could even show that it made no difference uh, to add the detergent up to 0.02%. So when you validate your assay, and this is published as a reference compound at one of the proteins, you do it, of course, for all three metallovatolactamase. And here the first surprise came up. I measured quite similar IC50s for women and the M1, but on M7 it was only half the IC50. So this was a strange uh, happening, and I was wondering, is anything wrong with my assay? Is there a shift always uh, in the direction of the M7, or is it an artifact? What is it? And so the question was, if I use different thiol-containing compounds, will the IC50s differ for all of them? And what we did was we looked at the drug bank. For those who do not know, this is a list of all known and approved drugs. And uh, we filtered them for thiol-containing compounds and found these 11 that you see here, starting from very easy compounds like cysteine up to more compo complex compounds like sulfonylprilate. And uh, we've ordered all 11 and uh, brought them to our assay and tested them at a concentration of 50 micromolar. And here uh, came up an inhibition pattern that we did not expect because uh, when you add thiols to a zinc-containing protein, you normally expect that a thiol builds a complex with the uh, zinc, draws it out of the binding site, and you have an inhibition of this compound. Uh, you have an inhibition of this protein, sorry. But here you see that there are some compounds like captopril which inhibit all of or three of the proteins. And then you have uh, compounds like cysteine, which have definitely a prevalence for the imp, the same for acetylcysteine, for example. And then you have compounds like thiopronin that inhibit more or less only two of uh, the three prote proteins. And you have compounds who do not nothing at all. So this was quite surprising. And uh, we want to investigate this effect further, but concentrate it first on all compounds that inhibit at least two of the proteins in above 70% uh, 
concentration here at 50 micromolar. And uh, first we measured the IC50s. Don't bother about the many values, it's just to show that there is no shift into the direction of one protein. For example, at captopril, as I showed before, the IC50 values at NDM1 and WIM are the same or more or less similar. For thiorphan, they are very similar for IMP and WIM. And this is not really showing any prevalence for any protein. So we were wondering, what is this effect? They cannot be only think withdrawing, but then because then uh, the IC50 values would be more or less in the same range. So we were looking for an assay that uh, helps us to discriminate between binders and think withdrawals. And uh, we found thermal shift assay to be suitable. Thermal shift assay starts with the hypothesis that in a solution you have a correctly folded protein with your hydrophilic sites outside and the hydrophobic pockets buried on the inside. And if you add a big, huge lipophilic dye like cypro orange, it cannot bind to the hydrophobic pockets, but swims around in the water surrounding and is quenched by the water. And if you start heating up the protein. It starts cracking up a little bit, starts to melt, and at one point where the real melting starts, the binding sites are open wide enough for the cypro orange to bind, and then it's unquenched and starts to fluorescate. So looks complicated, but brings out a little sim very simple graph, um, because you see here for the protein curve, the black one, there's nothing happening, it's quenched, 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 and then your protein starts to melt and the fluorescence goes up. And the whole postulate of this assay is that when you have a binding compound inside your binding pocket here, the complex of the protein ligand is uh, stabilized and your melting temperature is shifted up. So like you see here, if you have a real binder, then you are quenched, 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 and it starts melting here. So you see a shift of about 10 degrees uh, to the right side, so higher temperatures, more stable complex, good binder. Unfortunately, uh, in the theory, the melting point is defined as the turning point of the curve, so it's easier to build the first derivative and uh, just read out the melting temperature at the maximum of the curve. So now I can show you here again the protein in black. You see a melting point at slightly above 50 degrees. And if you add a binder like thiopronin here, you see a shift of 5 degrees to the right side. So an increase of the melting temperature, a binder. If you add a compound like EDTA, which is not binding at all, but only think calata, you see a decrease in the temperature of about 10 degrees. So you can really good discriminate with this assay if you have a binder or a think withdrawal. What I personally found very interesting that we have found uh, Dimacaprol, uh, which is also known as British anti -lucide. and this compound seems to withdraw the zinc and bind to another population of the protein as well. So very interesting for discrimination. And uh, we measured the thermal shifts of uh, the active compounds we've discovered before and see sometimes very huge shifts. So these are obviously very good binding compounds and not only think of straws. And uh, yeah, we were still wondering why are there the differences between uh, the three enzymes? Because if you look at the binding sites here, overlap, uh, you see again the two zinc atoms. And one of them is coordinated by three histidines, and the other one is coordinated by histidine, aspartate, and cysteine. So the binding sites are highly conserved. There are only small uh, differing uh, conformations for some residues. But if you start to zoom out a little bit, you will see that there are these two loops here which uh, limit the access to the binding site. So you see for the cyan, the NDM1, that the accessible part is much more open than, for example, for the dark green, which is very limited here. And this results in very different accessible binding site surfaces. So if you look here at the dark green, which is imipinamase 7, 
you see that the accessible binding site is much smaller than, for example, here in the VIM protein. This uh, may explain, for example, the uh, prevalence of this acetylcysteine and cysteine to these, uh, to these protein because it fits very good into this only small accessible binding site. But uh, last but not least was the open question what's the binding mode of these compounds and we were able to crystallize one of the uh, compounds, the thiopronin, inside NDM1. And again for orientation you are here with your one zinc atom, this is coordinated by the three histidines and the other zinc atom is coordinated again by the histidine, the aspartate and the cysteine and the thiol of the compounds binds here in the middle and if you overlay the structure with any other apocrystal, you see that this is the point where before was the water molecule. If you remember the mechanism I showed you in the beginning, I showed you this water which is localized between the two zinc atoms and uh, is used for the nucleophilic attack and this was exactly at this position. So the zinc atom is, uh, uh, sorry, the thiol atom is uh, rejecting the water from the binding site and replacing it at this point. So this is obviously, obviously the binding mode of these uh, thiol containing compounds. So before I go on, I have another question, or we have another question to you. Christian, can you please ask? Sorry for the delay. I always have to locate the switch of my microphone first. Yes, we would like um, to ask you uh, what kind of targets you are working on. We have told you about all these uh, bact bacteria targets, uh, but uh, just of interest, um, what kind of targets are you working on? Is the focus also bacteria or is it human, virus, fungi or parasites? Okay, about 60% already answered. Maybe we can get a few more responses. Getting up to 75%. Excellent. And I'm closing the poll in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Now. Okay, and the results are... I leave the, the communication of the result to um, Franka. Yes, so like we expected today, many bacterial friends. <laughs> so, but um, I guess we had a follow-up question. Yeah. Was, uh, we were wondering at what targets more specific, of course you want to focus on uh, bacteria, but what in bacteria is it? Enzymes, receptors, transporters, um, surface dependent molecules or anything else. And again, for those who opt for the anything else, um, yeah, maybe you are willing to share with us what kind of target uh, you are working on, key in anything that you're willing to share um, in the question box uh, as a response. Okay, we have 80% responses, that's super, uh, and I'm going to close the poll in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, now. And again, the result. I let the, uh, let uh, Franka comment about it. Yeah, yeah. This is very nice to see that we have so many people who are working on bacterial enzymes as well today. So I hope uh, your talk is useful. Uh, my talk is useful for you. So um, I would go on with the last part. Now the second last part of it. Um, I've showed you now four compounds which are active in vitro and uh, which were determined by two assays, but all of this is uh, unimportant if we cannot uh, go into the bacteria. 
And uh, this assay is a little bit more complicated because our compounds themselves don't have antibacterial act uh, activity. We've tested it before. And um, therefore, we measure again and again the minimum inhibitory concentration of imipenem. Imipenem is uh, an antibiotic which kills E. coli bacteria in the wild type with a concentration of 0 0.25 microgram per milliliter. So it's very effective against these gram negatives. And um, if we have now uh, bacteria which express these metallobatalactamases, the MIC of imipenem goes up very high. And if we add our compounds, we hoped uh, that it would go down again. So, for example, here in this E. coli strain, which expresses NDM1, the MIC of imipenem is not 0 0.25 anymore. It went up to 64 microgram per milliliter. This is far beyond levels that you can reach in human. And uh, when we add now our compounds, for example, here thiorphan, it goes down to uh, one microgram per milliliter again. So in bold are all the significant values, but uh, don't worry about the many values. It's just to show uh, the tendency. We always took uh, one E. coli strain to have the strain, uh, one strain which is similar for all proteins, and then the clinical important strain. And for NDM1, this was Klebsiella pneumoniae. For imipenemase 7, we took again the E. coli strain, which obviously did not uh, produce that many uh, imipenem as um, like it did for NDM1. The MIC went up to 2 microgram per milliliter. And uh, the pseudonymous aeruginosa are known as highly dangerous. And you see here, none of the compounds could really help, only the thiopronin. And uh, last but not least, for the WIM, you see, again, it helped a little, but not really, to the areas where we wanted to go back down. So this was, at this point, uh, very disappointing for us, because the compounds we took are approved drugs, and uh, we suggested they would simply go into bacteria. But uh, then we found this very interesting paper by Brown et al. I recommend it to read it to everybody who's working on uh, bacteria. And these guys uh, clustered. They, uh, they, they uh, stated that there is so little known about uh, the cell negative, uh, gram negative cell wall penetration, sorry. And uh, they clustered all uh, compounds which are approved for human indications and uh, bacterial indications. And they found out that there are two values which differ a lot uh, for the different targets. So one is the log D, and the second one is the total polar surface area. And uh, you see it here, the log D should be for uh, 1.6 to penetrate a human cell. But to go into a gram-negative uh, cell, it has to be around minus 2.8. So this is very differing. The same as for the TPSA. It's 70 square angstrom for human cells and very much more to go into gram-negative cells. And it's logical the compounds we've taken from the drug bank are approved for human indications. So they are anywhere in the Lipinski part of the world where they can go into a human cell. And the conclusion is clear. We need chemical modifications for our compounds. And now comes the funny part, because these parameters are accessible in CSAR. And before I start the session, I would uh, like to ask one last question for you. Um, maybe, Christian, you can ask it. Yes, of course. The last uh, question for you is essentially how much experience do you have at all with modeling software? Uh, do you model yourself? Um, do you have specialists in your department that do that for you and you just um, discuss and see the results with uh, them? or? Is modeling not a topic for you at all? Please give us your responses. Okay, 70%. Maybe we can get a few more responses. It's always very informative for us to get to know more about your style of working. 
All right, I'm going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one, now. And the result is here. Um, interestingly, the majority of you um, do all the modeling work yourselves. Uh, about 50% uh, and uh, the rest is about shared, no modeling at all versus um, specialists or others who model and uh, you see and discuss the results. Uh, thanks again for participating in our polls. Yes, so this is very interesting for me because even if half of you has experience with modeling, the other half does not have. So what I did now is I open CSAR and here's our 5A5 set that I showed you some slides before with the TO pronin inside. And if you click on the structure and press the space key, CSAR zooms in for you. And for better visualization, I uh, toggle off the ribbon, but turn on the surface of the protein. And we see here, this is nicely laying in this uh, sandwich structure of the NDM1. And um, if we toggle off the surface again, you see here for your orientation again, the one zinc which is coordinated by the three histidines, and the other one is here in white with the aspartate, the histidine, and the cystidines was withdrawn by the thiol here. And uh, what I wanted to show you now was the TPSA and the log D. TPSA we have already here, but if you click on the table sign here, you can choose different uh, properties uh, that are shown to you. And here under our Optibrium property, properties, you can select the log D. And you see thiopronin has a quite good log D. This is maybe the reason why it could make it to the Pseudonymus aeruginosa, where the rest could not go in. So, and uh, I put on the surface again, and you see there's so much space. If you cannot see the space by yourself, uh, here's the opportunity to show this fog. The fog in Caesar uh, is a measure of how many spaces there, it shows you the minimum uh, space which is left in your protein. So where you see fog, there's space for at least one fluorine atom. So you see at both sides of the molecule is so many space left. And uh, I want to build a, a little bigger molecule today. And so I just uh, press here the editor button. And here comes up my editor window. and um, I want to add some uh, structural properties to this uh, uh, carbon here. And we have a lot of space here, so I mark this one, make it a carbon, or just press C on my keyboard. And um, now I'm adding simply a ring to this uh, and connect this at the end by, this, uh, by just drawing over it. And because I wanted to make uh, my TPSA bigger, I make it uh, a piperacine and bring it back to the table. And here you directly see, when you close the editor, that this is a very favorable uh, addition. You can have nicely here, when we toggle the surface off again, we have a good contact here to the aspartate, have a happy ring here, which is paying a lot, uh, was just giving a lot of uh, benefit for your estimated binding affinity, so it went slightly down. You have a good link and lipophilicity, lipophilicity index, and we just went up with our polar surface area and went down with our log D, so everything we wanted. So maybe we can build a, a little bit more. So I always like having the surface around when I model something new, because then you see where you could clash or something and starting from the already optimized compound and going back to, yeah, this position was not contributing a lot. So I add a carbon here, another carbon here. Because I want to become more, po more polar, I add another uh, hydroxyl group, bring it to the table. And you see, just by making two uh, modifications, you nearly doubled your uh, TPSA and optimized your log D as well. So it's very easy in CSAR to play around and optimize these compounds. So 
unfortunately, <laughs> I know a lot more about this, but this is an ongoing project, so I'm not allowed to tell you more. I'm very sorry, but uh, you can start from this as well and uh, go on and on as much as you want. So, um, to sum up in the end, I uh, in this project we could um, recommendantly produce three different metallo-beta-lactar mazes in big amounts and uh, develop a fluorescence-based assay which served as an assay for all three of them and uh, we could determine the potency of known approved file containing drugs and uh, validated four compounds which inhibited all three of the metallo-beta-lactar mazes in vitro and could confirm that they are real binders and not only think withdrawals by Toma shift assay. We could show the binding mode of one of the compounds uh, by crystallizing it in the NDM1 and uh, could start with the investigation of activity in bacteria. And last but not least, I could show you how to model these compounds to make them more accessible uh, for to penetrate gram-negative bacteria. So, with that, I have to give acknowledgments, of course, to my former colleagues in Frankfurt. That's the group of Prof Professor Proschak at the Goethe University in Frankfurt, and as well the group of Professor Wichelhaus from the University Hospital. These guys uh, did the isolation of the proteins from patients that really were in the Frankfurt Hospital. and. Um, Yes, of course, I would like uh, to thank you for joining and your interest in this uh, topic. As Christian said in the beginning, you will uh, get an email with a free trial license in the next days, so you can try to model the compounds yourself. And only for today's participants, because we saw so many people who do not model, we um, want to offer you to send us your CSAR sessions. So just download it take your trial license and uh, model compounds in your target environment and then send us your sessions. Uh, would be best if you add an explanation what you're looking for and uh, what the properties were, where you wanted to have and uh, you get a free evaluation from us, if you want, of course. Yeah, with that, uh, I would like to close. Thanks again for coming. Last but not least, uh, the announcement for our next webinar. I guess Christian wants to do this, no? Sorry, I'm always a bit slow to locate the switch for my microphone. Yes, uh, thanks also from my side for participating. Um, we have a few questions, so uh, those of you for, who asked these questions, please um, stay on the line. Um, uh, but before we uh, get to that, the next uh, webinar is going to be given by uh, Professor Dr. Gerhard Ecker from the University of Vienna uh, with the title, The Power of Linked Open Data Exploiting Ligand Transporter Interaction Profiles. So this is all about uh, transporter research, research uh, and I can tell you that uh, uh, Gerhard Ecker is doing uh, some cutting edge um, um, uh, scientific work there. So we hope we see you at this webinar as well. And um, with that, we close the presentation part and now come to the questions. <laughs>